Wait for everybody to get turned around in the front seat there. Good morning. It's nice to hear all the chatter again today. Our opening hymn is number 119, Just As I Am. suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that, for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. Isaiah writes to us uh, according to what God has instructed him to, and it's always it's always kind of intimidating to hear the word of God sometimes uh, to tell us what we should do, what we shouldn't do, but most of the time God encourages us in what he says. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. 
to know that the world, the word sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? Here ends our first reading. Our second reading is from the book of James, chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 12. And as James has encouraged us to be doers of the word and to uh, take care of, of you know, our neighbors and our friends and everything that way, he also uh, talks here about you know, different professions and talks a little bit about um, who we are as people. He writes, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example, although they are so large, and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. When the, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Here ends our second reading. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on in that reading, and just a reminder of, you know, it's sometimes just the little things in life that can make a difference. Our gospel for today is from Mark chapter 8. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable standing for the reading of the gospel. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Peter warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and rise again after three days. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what could a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. 
You may be seated. And we sing hymn number 155 on Eagle's Wings. Today's gospel is one of those familiar passages, at least I hope it's familiar to you, with Jesus talking with his disciples and asking that question, who do people say that I am? And their answer, but then Jesus puts it much more bluntly, who do you say that I am? Asking his disciples if they know who Jesus is. And I think if we were to be asked that question today too, you know, who do you say that Jesus is? We would all have a slightly different answer. But it would all, we would all include that he is the Lord, he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God. But we might have, you know, varying answers. And in Mark's Gospel, we hear simply Peter say, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. Other Gospels, in response to that question, we hear Peter say, you are the Christ, the Son of God, you know, and you are the Christ, the living Son of the Lord God. And But it comes right back down to He is the One. He is the One who was sent into this world for us and for our salvation. And then He goes on to tell the disciples what it means for Him to be the Messiah. And it just doesn't make sense to Peter or to the others that the Messiah, the Christ, the, the Savior of the world would say that I'm going to be betrayed, arrested, suffer, be crucified, die, and be resurrected. And and I'm sure that if I had been there when he would have said that, I'm going to die. You know, I wouldn't have been able to hear, you know, about the resurrection. 
because I would have been so focused on that Jesus is not going to be with us anymore that I would have been just lost, you know. And I think that's where the disciples got hung up too. Jesus had raised people from the dead. We know that. But if Jesus died, I mean, what was going to happen then? And the disciples couldn't figure that out. As I was thinking about this text, uh, the words to an old Neil Diamond song came to mind. I am, I said. And in that song, you know, it starts out, Ellie's fine, sun shines most of the time. They're making my way back to New York is his home. He had traveled across the country to try to find, you know, fulfillment, whatever. But he found that he wasn't fulfilled there. And he cried out. And he was, you know, no one heard, no one cared. And I sometimes think about Jesus. You know, he left heaven. This, this wonderful place of glory to be with God and, and to be where he had been since the very beginning of time. He left heaven and he came down to this earth. And, you know, this place on earth is fine, but it's not home for Jesus. And I think about Jesus with his telling his disciples that I'm going to be arrested, suffer, and die on the cross. And I think about on the cross, Jesus' words, you know, my father, uh, why hast thou forsaken me? And, my, and, and so he must have felt at that point in time on the cross, just like Neil Diamond did as he was over here in, in L.A., longing for home in New York and not having anything in between and not having anybody here. And, and you know, on the cross, it seems like Jesus is feeling that very same thing. You know, that, you know, God, do you really care? Why hast thou forsaken me? But yet, the last thing that Jesus says on that cross is, into your hands I commend my spirit. So he realized, he remembered everything that was to be and who he is and who he was, is to be forever. The Lord, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who came and gave himself for you and for me. And I, I think about that, you know, that he came. You know, he left all of that glory, all of that, all of that wonder to come down to this earth to live just like one of us. To know the ins and outs, to know the, you know, as James wrote about the tongue and about how many things can happen. And, and I think about Jesus' words and how he responded to people. You know, last Sunday we had Jesus traveling to Tyre and, he, and casting a demon out of a, a young girl and restoring hearing and speaking to a man. And between that there were other healings. There was a feeding of the 4,000 and then Jesus sends his disciples off and he seems to just, we don't really hear what happens to Jesus for a little bit. But we know in other gospels, he goes up to a mountain, he goes somewhere and he finds time to pray. It takes time to be with God in that life of prayer that he often models for us. And in the prayer that he models for us, we know that was words by heart that it takes you know, for us to take time to remember our Maker, to remember our Savior, to remember that God is with us at all times. And just not so many days ago, I had a conversation with someone again, and they said that, you know, if I, when I miss worship on a Sunday morning, the rest of the week doesn't seem to be right. And it's kind of the very same thing, you know, when we, I mean, I notice it anyway, if I, if I go through the whole day without taking a little bit of time for prayer, a little bit of time to spend with God, it just doesn't seem like quite the right kind of day so often. But to take that time, you know, for prayer, and, and sometimes when Jesus would heal the sight of someone or cast out a demon, he said, this can only be done by prayer. By involving God in all of all the aspects of our life. And so as Jesus has been living with his disciples and healing and teaching and doing God's work in the community, they have been learning and observing who Jesus is. And they come to profess, you are the Christ. Peter does anyway, you are the Christ. But then... He says, you know, we can't let all of this stuff happen. 
what, you know, when Jesus tells him, this is what it means that I am the Christ, the Messiah. You know, all of that suffering and death just doesn't seem right. And later in the Gospels, as Jesus sets his eyes on Jerusalem and starts to begin that final journey toward Jerusalem and toward the cross, some of his disciples try to talk him out of it. They say, you know, we were just there, and they were trying to stone you. They tried to drive you over a cliff to put you to death, and you're going back. we got to do something different. So the disciples, you know, weren't, weren't really sure. They didn't know about this stuff. But when that time came when Jesus set out for Jerusalem, Thomas, the one we know as Doubting Thomas, says to Jesus and to the others, let us go with him, for there's no better place to be than with Jesus. You know, so the disciples had come to know, to believe, to trust that Jesus is the Messiah. And that is such an important thing for us to hear that confession. You know, when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Oh, you know, a prophet, Elijah, Moses, you know, who knows? They weren't sure. But Jesus wanted to know that the disciples, someone knew for sure who he was. So he says, point blank, who do you say that I am? And Jesus asked that very same question to each and every one of us. Who do you say that Jesus is? You know, is he just a prophet? Is he just a really good man? Or is he Jesus Christ, the Lord? C.S. Lewis is a person you may be familiar with. He was a devout atheist and spoke against God, against Jesus, against Christianity, but then had an enlightenment. And he wrote some pretty good books, one of which is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You know, a, a children's story, basically, kind of. But it's one of those that talks so much about God and so much about who people are. And C.S. Lewis once said that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Son of God. You know, and that's kind of where we are. Who do you say that Jesus is? And as I've mentioned at the start, you know, we probably would all have a little bit different answer to that but our answers would be basically he is the Lord he is the Son of God he is my Savior and that's the important thing to know that he is my Savior he is your Savior personal and I've said before many times too that we don't just need to know about God or about Jesus we need to know Jesus we need to know God we need to read the Bible study the Bible to come to worship, to hear the words that God has for us. The words that some men and women have written down, instructed by God to share them for us and for our salvation. So that as we read through the four Gospels especially, we look at the differences that are within them. But most importantly, we look at the similarities. How they all tell us that Jesus is the Lord. That Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. He has come into this world to save us. To be the paving or the paying price of our salvation. He died on the cross for you and for me. And it's one of those hard things for us to really think about. And that's why Good Friday is such a hard, hard service, hard worship service to attend. Because it seems so sad, so final. We read those words of Jesus. We hear how he's flogged, beaten, put on the cross. Those haunting words, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, but also we hear, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And those final words, into your hands I commend my spirit. And at the time of Jesus' death, you know, we strip the altar, we make it black, we make it dark, we make it bleak, and it hurts. It's just like when one of our loved ones dies, it hurts. And there seems to be this darkness that comes over our spirit because of the emptiness that's there. Jesus came to conquer that emptiness, to fill that emptiness again with God's love, 
To know that Jesus is the Son of God. To know that Jesus is the Christ. To know that Jesus is my Savior. That's what Jesus wants us to know. And he asked those questions of the disciples. Who do people say that I am? But more importantly, who do you say that I am? Jesus asks each and every one of us that question. Who do you say that I am? Our answer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are my salvation. You are the one that God has sent for me and for all people, for us, for us and for our salvation. He is the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Gracious God, we like the disciples have these questions asked of us and, and it's hard for us to really envision that Jesus died on the cross for us and for our salvation. It, it, it's easy to sit here in, wor in worship and, and to hear the words of Jesus to be our Savior that God sent him into the world and we picture this little baby in a manger and all the miracles that he did. And, and like so much of our lives, we, we want it to be pleasant. We want to see the good in all things. But the evil of the world is why Jesus came, to save us from that evil. So help us to hold Jesus in our hearts and to trust in your love and your grace. Guide us each day. We pray in Jesus' name. We continue our worship as we sing our offering response. <clears throat> Come, all who are loved by God, come to his table. We come to eat, to drink, and our hearts are glad. We remember the way that Jesus showed us his love. On the evening before he died, he had supper with his friends. During that meal, he took the loaf of bread and gave thanks for it, broke it, and passed it around with these words. This is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And after the meal, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks for it and passed it around with these words. This is my blood shed for you. Drink this and remember me. Remembering Jesus. Oh, we'll do that later. I'm sorry. The body, the table of our Lord is set and invite you to come to the table.
sins are entirely forgiven. You are in God's grace. May the body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. As we come to God in prayer today, do we have any additional prayer requests? Hope for my mom's family. She lost her brother this week. Okay. Sorry to hear that. bow our heads and come to God. Gracious Lord, we know that you always hear us when we pray. We trust in that because we know that your son Jesus turned to you so often in your prayer and talked to us about prayer and taught us to pray. So we thank you for coming to us, for hearing our prayers, for knowing what's in our hearts and on our minds, to know our joys our sorrows, our hopes, and our dreams. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of all people, that you are all-knowing and all-present. Thank you for walking with us each day of our lives. Lead us in your path and help us to be your witnesses in the world so that all people might know who you are, but more importantly, know your Son Jesus as Lord and Savior. Bless our country and the other nations of the world. Bless all of our leaders and, and give them the courage to rule fairly, to seek peace at all times. We give you thanks for our military because we know that the world isn't peaceful. So we thank you that we have troops that are in troubled places of the world to try to bring peace and hope to bring a glimmer of what might be, protect them as they serve. We pray the same for our police officers and so many others that put themselves in danger every day. We give you thanks for our, our medical professionals and ask that you lead them, that you guide them, that you help them find new cures for old diseases and new methods, but help them mostly to hear what the patient has to say and help them not to rely just on testings and different things, but have them trained so that they know how to observe and read what the body is telling them. We ask that you would reach out and protect these people today, grant them your healing. We pray for Shirley and Dean and Sue and Nolan and Bob and Gloria. Maxine, and Jeannie, Mary, Beth, Barb, Brody, and Lee, Mary and Gabe, Mary and Cheryl, we pray for Scott, we pray for these now that we mention silently in our hearts. And we pray especially too for families who mourn the death of a loved one. Pray especially for Shirley and her family as they mourn the loss of the death of her brother, who was an uncle to many. So bless them with that promise that he now continues to live in your care and in your keeping, that he isn't just lost, as we sometimes say, but that he is completely in your care. Help us to trust that always. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 181, Rock of Ages.